Well, we're here again today with uh, Jed Mackay, and today we are talking about Join In. We had met before and we had talked a little bit about your tenure with TV Ontario and a number of the shows that you worked with with Polka Dot Door. And uh, this is a unique interview, Jed, because uh, this is the first interview I've done where the questions have not been assembled by me. But I kept on right. getting uh, emails and YouTube requests saying, hey, we want to hear what Jed has to say about the show we created, Join In. And it was yeah. just a little bit after my time. I remember it but I don't remember um, watching it the way that I used to watch Today's Special and some of the other shows that you wrote for. So right. um, after uh, after some convincing, I agreed to do it. So the questions that <laughs> we're actually going to be using today are questions that Join In fans have assembled. But um, the first question I want to start off with, just as we jump right on in, is I know that there is a link between Today's Special and Join In at the very least in terms of um, from what I understand, the money or the, the, the time slot that was set aside for today's special had some ki kind of connection to join in. C can you help me understand that? Um, I think only only that, um, I think Polka Dot Door used to air at 6 and uh, today's special or whatever show came next aired at 6.30. So that, uh, as I recall, that could be a number of different shows. It could have been... Uh, uh, Dear Aunt Agnes or Book Mice or today, you know, whatever the different shows were, but that was like TVO's power hour. <laughs> and um, they just dominated uh, in, in those years, 70s and 80s, dominated that time slot in, in Toronto. So, uh, you know, in a sense, we didn't sort of inherit a time slot, but we were, we, we were slotted into the same time slot. And usually what that meant was, whereas Polka Dot Door was... Uh, specifically really targeted at preschool, you know, two to five, that's about it. Um, all the other shows had a much wider age range and the thought was that uh, parents might be watching or older siblings might be watching so you would see in all of them kind of subject matter and what's, how people are talking and what's happening is a little more sophisticated and a little, you know, a little more complex. And that was certainly in our mind with, with Join In. Was there any connection in terms of today's special had come to an end, Clive had wanted to move on, did you inherit kind of the budget that was used for today's special to produce something as equally top notch? Because Join In was quite involved. It was. I think that one of the great successes of Join In was it was actually done on a relatively small budget, but you can't really tell hmm. And uh, in our minds. And we used to think, you know, really, given what we had to do the show with, it's all on the screen. And I think it's... Uh, the crew and everyone really did an amazing job. We, we didn't have a great budget. I have no idea what today's special budget was, um, but uh, you know it probably might have been higher than ours. I, it probably was, because I think, I think what probably happened was, and you might find others who would know, when today's special ended, probably two other shows got done with more or less the money that you know was available. But you know, I really don't know. I do know that... Um, we really had to squeeze a dollar. But you know what? Honestly, so did Clive in today's special. We all did. TVO, we never had the giant, giant budgets. Well, I remember Ruth Vernon telling me that towards the end of the 90s, uh, pardon me, towards the end of the 80s and the early 90s, yeah. that the mentality started to shift to TVO. And instead of creating original programming, they would instead take a budget, whereas they could spend, you know, I'll, I'll pull a number out of my head, but, you know, 10 grand on so yeah. many episodes, they, they would instead license. Um, other shows and get like so much more bang for their buck. So yeah. that, that's what I understand was the shift as well. Um, that's pretty much what happened, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's jump right in. These are all questions from, from devoted fans out there. First one, really simple. Where and when did the idea from the show come about? The show came about um, when I was doing Polka Dot Door. One of the things I had uh, been told by Ruth was that I... I might get the chance to create a show if Polka Dot Door went well. So uh, as a result, I got the chance to create one. And um, uh, so I thought about what you, what, you know, the question is what do you want to do? How is it going to be different from uh, what's on the air? How is it going to be different from today's special, which of course is such a great show and had done so well and everything else that was kind of coming along or percolating. So the thoughts that kind of directed directed me, and I developed it with um, Clive Endersby and Laurie Hauser. All three of us kicked around ideas once the basic thing was there. Was we wanted to have um, 
I think the element that I really wanted was participation. At that time, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, kids were just couch potatoes, watching, sitting and watching TV. TV was having a, an effect of making them very passive. Viewing was passive. And so the thought was, let's do a show where the, the viewing experience is really active. So not, And I don't mean in the way of clap along to the song or, you know, let's do jumping jacks. But every sequence, you can ask a question, you can try to solve a you know, solve, solve a problem the characters are having, or maybe it's a game riddle, or uh, it can be a plot element where you have to say, fill something in that maybe one of our characters has forgotten. So we tried to make it so that virtually every sequence of the show had some element of joining in. And, and there were also, for sure, there were also, you know, sing the chorus and, you know, make do the motions and all, all the sort of stuff that's typical. <clears throat> so uh, that was something we really wanted to do. And the other thing that I thought was really important to do was as we're going through the 80s, it became really clear that the world, <clears throat> the, the, the preschoolers were growing up in, <clears throat> excuse me, that the preschoolers were growing up in, was going to be a radically different world from the one preceding, which is to say far more multi-ethnic. And that, you know, rather than just being kind of, it used to be you had, you know, a, a much simpler world, I'll put it that way. And that was reflected in hosts of television shows, that was reflected in the world that television was presenting. Um, even Polka Dot Door, you know, we used to switch up the ethnicity of the host just as, as once we got into the 80s with that, into the time that I was doing, we kept mixing that up a little bit more. But it was really clear this was going to be the future, probably in every large city and you know, everywhere, probably. You know, and, and I'm sure that was reflective of the, mul the melting pot of what Toronto has become, just so well, multicultural. Yeah. Like you can't have a, a children's TV show and be socializing uh, children through media without exposing them to you know, different cultures, different races. Exactly. And, and that's, you know, now it's sort of taken for granted. But when we saw it, we would see it going into classrooms, uh, you know, for Polka Dot Door, other shows we were doing. And you're saying, wow, like the, 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 the makeup of the classrooms here, of these kids in this, you know, nursery school or this daycare or whatever, this is going to be a huge change coming down the line. And this is what it's going to be. So with that in mind, we wanted to create a show where that was reflected in the core cast members and then I made a decision that we would never actually mention it. Uh, I had this idea, I still do actually, that you can be, it's equally defeats the purpose if we keep referring to the fact that you know you're Portuguese and, and I'm Japanese but gosh we love ice cream and I, I thought rather than sort of saying well there's a shared uh, humanity there, let's say, is rather saying, isn't it odd? We're both very different, really, and it's, it's peculiar that we should like the same thing. So rather than focusing on that, I thought, and anyway, little kids don't focus on as much as adults do anyway. So I thought, let's not have, our characters are just going to be characters who work, they work together, and they, you know, play together, but really, uh, they don't ever reference anything more about the fact that there's three individuals, and their ages were different. Jacob, you know, uh, the Jacob character is much older than the other two. But no one ever said really, well, Jacob, gosh, you're so old. Isn't it amazing that you still like to sing or, you know, or anything like that? So we try. I find a lot of those kind of prejudicial thoughts are built into shows um, unconsciously. Uh, but, and I don't know, even well-meaning things like let's do certain awards for, you know, the something heritage awards, I'll fill in the blank. And I go, well, but that kind of, that separates you out from, just saying, let's do a great show, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, that's what we were trying to reflect, whether that was wrong-headed or right-headed, I don't know. And um, the third thing we wanted to do, because uh, uh, music was a real passion of mine, still is, was that I wanted, at, at that point, I didn't feel shows musically reflected what kids were now listening to. You know, the diversity of what little kids hear, particularly if they have, you know, their parents or their older brothers and sisters, is, is tremendous. And I felt that um, I would watch a show and somebody would say, um, you know, this is a reggae song. 
And let's sing it now. We go bunk a dink a dink a dink a dink. We sing a reggae song. And then now this is a blues. Dink a dink a dink. Every song sounds it's all four four. All sounds identical. And you can do a blues where you're going, I'm so sad and I'm feeling really awful. And you're going, well, actually, I'm feeling pretty cheery when I hear you sing it that way. You know, whereas a blues is maybe a little got a little more oomph to it. So we decided we were going to do. Music, the songs would reflect more the real type of music. So when and we spread the net very wide, we would do anything. So country or or reggae or blues or what I call real rock and roll, not kid show rock and roll at the time, but like you know, real rock and roll. And for me, uh, you know, the music on Sesame Street, wonderful as it was, uh, was kind of like some kind of light jazz or something, and it didn't really reflect like real rock and roll, you know, and Stuff kids heard, heavy metal or whatever. So, so those are the three, the three things we were driving at when we created the show. Well, since you, since you mentioned music, Jed, who wrote and sang the opening theme? I wrote it, and it was sung by uh, Bruce Lee, very very important guy. So I'll mention him right up front. Bruce Lee was the music director for the show. Absolutely critical. Uh, player in the you know in, in what we were doing, mm -hmm. he took care of all the studio sessions. He hired you know great studio musicians. Um, the singers were three studio guys, and I know you know I know them as Neil, Debbie, and Johnny. I, unfortunately, I couldn't tell you their last name, but they were the ones who did the song, <clears throat> along with the just the cream of of uh, Toronto session guys playing in the band for all our all our shows. Wow. And what would those sessions look like? Would there just be, you know, the gauntlet of songs for a season of episodes? Come into the studio for two or three days and we're going to knock this out? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty well what they would do. We had all the, of course, all the songs were lined up before, you know, long before we got into shooting. And um, we would have rehearsed them all with Bruce to get keys and arrangements and everything else. And then he would do the finals. Sometimes he would do the real finals while we were shooting the show, or it was you know just in terms of the production schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would just you know bang a bunch out, and uh, it was his baby. Was there a crossover in terms of people you were using from the folks that uh, I guess I don't know if you were in any of the sessions, but um, the, the folks that Clive would have been using with today's special was there a kind of a, a group of people that you would be drawing from the same folks. Do you know, I don't know, I, I'll just, I don't know, I was never, I don't think I was ever at a Today's Special session, but I would guess that Clive as well used just the top people, you know, he could find who were around, and so it would be, I would expect we used, you know, uh, many of the same people, yeah. Now the show They're so versatile, you can't really tell, though, that's what's right. so fantastic, you know? Mm -hmm. The show took place in Lindsay, Ontario, where exactly was, was the show shot? Was it shot in Toronto? Yeah, the show was shot in Toronto, we shot... Uh, although we did, we shot all, virtually all the exterior things were shot in Lindsay. So we would go out um, every fall. We sort of started, we go, I think we went out almost every year. I think it was pretty much um, September, maybe, you know, it's nice. One of my favorite times of year, early October, so everything looks, I like the way it looks, and the light is good. And uh, we would shoot on the streets of Lindsay and all around Lindsay and, and do all our exterior stuff there. And then we came back and we shot it, um, most of it, almost all of it, I think, was shot at Sherman Law's studio in Toronto, where we also shot Polka Dot Door. In fact, TV and Terror shot virtually, you know, I think, all the shows there for a long period of time. And it was out in um, the West End. No, I think it's no longer there. I think it's houses now. Were there any parts of the show shot inside of the front building that you see almost virtually at the beginning of every episode? No, I think that building is, it's certainly in all the, uh, I think it's in every episode. But anyway, no, we never shot inside there. The way anyway, I'm going to say that, i got to think. We, we, we altered the way the, thing, you know, the, the building actually was for when we were shooting. And I don't believe we ever shot inside there, maybe once, but I, I don't think so. How was the cast selected? Just to see the age-old way, just auditioning. We uh, had the script, you know, we knew we were going to do, and um, we just did a days and days of auditioning. It was pretty straightforward. But it was important to me, you know, we, we, we auditioned, I think we did musical auditions probably, and then acting, you know, we had a bunch of things we were looking for. 
Now, like Polka Dot Door, were the episodes rehearsed prior to taping, or were they just taped in blocks? No, they were, like Polka Dot Door, um, they were really, really rehearsed beforehand. We think we shot, Polka Dot Door shot uh, five a week, and Join In shot three a week. So we shot, we sh rehearsed for two days and shot for three. Um, so those first two days, we would kind of do music, you know, music rehearsals, then every we before we even got into the studio though and i think it was critical for um joined in on in my mind critical for every show we would do you know what you call them church rehearsals or wherever whatever hall you're in and we would work out choreography and camera angles so uh the cast would have you know pretty good idea already what was going to happen and particularly how these things are going to be choreographed because unlike most shows uh, our guys sang live, so they weren't singing to a track. So not only did they have to remember lyrics to a song, you know, about, and it could be anything, you know, where there's some one of those sequence songs you're trying to remember, you know, on the bear and the bird, and mm -hmm. I think trying to remember all of that at the same time, you know, three, two, three, you know, one, you're trying to remember where you're going, and then you got to do some little move or the cameras are making it was very demanding on the cast. Not to mention if they're singing two or three part harmony too and trying well, to which, blend. Exactly, you know, which they were. And uh, and then everyone's mic has, you know, there's just so much going on in the mics. Uh, in hindsight, I'm not quite sure why I felt, I know why I wanted to have them sing live, but I got to say in hindsight that may not have been the most brilliant thing I ever came up with. Well, what it, what but, it does uh, say, now that we've seen That's why we had to rehearse so much. Right. And what it does say, now that we've seen the finished product, is that you know you made the right casting decisions because the folks that you hired were extremely talented and able to carry the weight of all those responsibilities. Uh, I'm just you know blown away by what they had to do. It's it's as you're going on, as you can imagine, it's you know week two, week three, week four, week five, and here come four more songs, you know, and more things to remember and just coming at you. And uh, we basically had to complete uh, you know a show a day in um, in the studio. So. It was very high pressure, and, and they're amazing. Now, they're just amazing. What year did Join In start? Well, I think it went on air in '89. I think it aired from '89 to '95, if I'm correct. And um, that means we probably started thinking about it '87. Uh, and then I would say '88, we would have. Um, you know, I, I can't be totally sure. I think '88 we would have written, you know, a pilot. We would have everything would have been sort of fine tuned as we went along, and then we would have written, you know, pretty much all the scripts as well. So by the time we got into fall '88, I would say we probably started shooting, and um, I don't know, you know, probably finished by Christmas '88, or maybe even into a bit later in '89. I'm not sure. So I'm trying to put my my feet in your shoes, and I'm thinking you're the executive. Well, you're the producer of Polka Dot Door during this time concurrently. So yeah. you're a bit you're a busy guy. <laughs> yeah, I was a busy guy there. So one show was always in pre-production. One show would be in post, and then whenever we went into production, there was only one show. Then you know, so it was trying to balancing those schedules. I don't, and, I, if um, I were you, I'd be having these horrible nightmares of you know Pokeru showing up on the join-in set or Muffy Mouse <laughs> being in the wrong spot at the wrong time. <laughs> You know, it might have happened uh, if it had been left up to me, but luckily I had like the, the best staff people and people helping that I could, so that didn't happen. <laughs> if it's up to me, it probably would have been complete chaos. <laughs> Jed, what was the biggest challenge in producing the show? You know, I think the biggest challenge was, um, I, I, you know, actually for... I think the music. I think doing the music. Uh, you know, it's um, it's it's very different. You know, you want, what the the real production challenge is trying to do within the time you've got and the budget you've got. So you know, there's obviously that. But I would say, when we were shooting, the thing where you would be holding your breath would be when they were doing the songs. So that's it's hard on the cast as well, and you don't want to exhaust them. And um, at the same time, we have to do it because the producer seems to demand it so um, that was probably I think that was the most challenging it'd be interesting to hear what uh, some of the directors or the cast members thought but uh, I think that's probably it which episodes have had a significant impact on viewers in terms of responses that you've heard maybe fan mail emails 
Yeah, we we sort of got a bunch in that. I think you know the thing that the the thing that seemed to have the most impact was kids seeing other kids who looked like them. So this is the multi-ethnic thing, and we heard that a lot, and that was very rewarding. You know that say Kia would be the favorite character, you know, and often of kids who were, uh, you know, Indian or East Asian or whatever, like they, they, but they related, they related to that character in the setting we had, mm -hmm. you know, and that sort of thing, I, 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 that was great. I got to say that that was the best, you know, um, you know, episodically, um, I, don't, I can't recall, you know, we, we got reward, you know, we got some awards and, and nominations and all that for various things. And I don't know, <coughs> unlike, you know, like say today's special, you know, you've got the death show, you know, got the, 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 the trilogy of things that were, and we didn't, I don't think we really tackled that sort of thing on Join In too much. We went kind of the other way with just participation and, and being engaged in the show. So we didn't really, I don't, I don't recall hearing too much about that. You know, we had a couple of things where we tried to deal with the issues that kids often have to deal with, like friends who move away, which was built in when, you know, Pamela Sinha left the show. We thought that was a complete build-in. And, uh, uh, you know, situations that maybe, you know, trying to uh, obey your, you know, your parents maybe wanting to do something that you don't want to do, and I, just those sorts of things that kids deal with. When Pam decided to leave the show, did that kind of throw you for a loop, and were you kind of scrambling to find a replacement? Um, well, I think you're sorry to see someone go. You know, mm -hmm. she was uh, she, she was very popular. Pam just uh, I think that was I think I'm right in saying that was her first her first TV job. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm sure I think she was still going to theater school like when we started. So I can't recall now. But I believe that's true. So anyway, she was, you know, great. She's got a smile that just explodes off the screen. Kids absolutely loved her. But she wanted to, you know, I think she felt she'd done two years is enough and she wanted to do other stuff. So, um, you know, you're sorry to see her go. Uh, at the same time, you think, well, like you do, we'll just find someone else, you know, if, if we can. Uh, so we got uh, Mishu, who was equally fantastic. I mean, we... We felt we really, really did. You know, we're very lucky in the people we were able to cast in the show, and they, they both, both, both of them worked really well. Now, did you uh, find Mishu through Polka Dot Door? Because I know that she was on Polka Dot Door as well. I, I knew her from Polka Dot Door, and uh, you know, I'm not sure. My memory, faulty as it may be, is that I, I she may have just been offered the job. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a feeling. I might have done that because I knew from uh, Polka Dot Door how good she was. I knew she'd be right for it. Um, and I just, just, honestly, I can't remember whether we, we did an audition. But at, at that point, you see, the thing about the thing was at that point, the show was a little more set than the first time. Now we kind of knew who the characters were, what we wanted. We had to get somebody who's going to be different from Pamela. I mean, a character would be different from Nikki, let's say. Um, but we were also wanted to try and keep the same makeup of cast and stuff so I think I think I have a feeling I, that I just thought Mishu was the one and, and asked her if she would do it uh, and if we did a bunch of auditions that would be just you know to make sure that uh, that feeling was right let's see now you were very modest a second ago when you were talking about the awards that the show earned it was uh, it, it was quite spectacular I things I've read uh, the show was very 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 well loved and honored by um, many institutions. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about the awards that it achieved over the five or six years it was on. Um, well, the ones I, the ones I recall, <laughs> uh, I, I'm say, I keep saying that like I'm losing my mind, you know, but uh, it, got, it got nominated for Gemini, the Gemini three times, never won the Gemini, uh, which is unfortunate. I think it deserved it, but it, um, that's me. Um, but anyway, it was a finalist three times, and uh, all those shows, um, you know, I remember being very proud of. It won um, 
the uh, Alliance for Children Television. It won there. It did win their top award. Uh, and I think the episode that won it was, it might have been Little Red Riding Hood, which is one of my favorite, favorite episodes. Um, it was either that, which, which, which featured a, uh, I mean, you as being a music guy um, might enjoy it. It featured a, a, a long song version of um, Little Red Riding Hood, kind of done in the style of uh, Minnie the Moocher by Cab Calloway with a whole bunch of call and answer choruses and real kind of, you know, real kind of descending minor key little riff and uh, um, one of my favorite sequences we did in the show and uh, the princess had Jackie Richardson who I adore and she did uh, a couple of um, soulful numbers in uh, in that one which were also standouts so I uh, got that and it was also nominated for um, it was a finalist for uh, uh, as I recall the Prix Jeunesse in Europe which was a nice feather in her cap and I think there, there may have been a couple others, but, but now I've forgotten them, sorry to say. I, I know that there is a, an institution that preserves the history of significant television down in the States, and I know that a number of your episodes <laughs> from today's special were requested to be a part of this archive. You'll have to remind me the name of the institution, but I also know there are a number of join-in episodes that were... There are. It's well. Museum of Broadcasting, and they, were, they requested some stuff, and... Do you know, for the life of me, I have to go back and look somewhere. I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now. I've forgotten about that. They did, yeah. They requested um, two or three episodes as well, which is very nice. How did you come up? What was your inspiration for the original songs that you would compose for the show? Uh, wow. That's one of those funny questions, isn't it? Like, what's your inspiration for your song? Well, let me, maybe let me ask it this way. Um, how much of your inspiration for the songs would be dictated by the script? Was it all prescription writing for the songs? Um, it's to a degree. I mean, we would, you know, when the script was being written, um, writers would um, have a, you know, basically have a song idea. And most of the writers wrote their own lyrics, uh, which is something that was fine with me. So they would have an idea for a song and, and put something in, and we would work with that usually. Um, you know, it was important in terms of the pacing of the show. You, you, you want to, there's just times when you want to drop a song in to kind of goose it up a little bit, and um, then the style of the song would depend on what else you've been doing during that year and what you felt the show kind of needed and what would be a little... Then there's always a thing, what's a little challenge here? You know what I'm saying? I wonder what a little bluegrass song would sound like here. But, you know... Um, so and then sometimes the style of a show you would try to reflect if the show took place in a certain time frame maybe you try to reflect the time frame in the music or you know something like that so uh, that was about it I mean it was it was really more um, I don't know you know how it is I mean you're listening to something called the greatest hits out of New Orleans and you're kind of saying wow I really love the way Fats Domino play you know. And then what you say, oh, how about me? You just start doing it to the song that's there, and it kind of works. You go, okay, that works. And, uh, it, was that, it was that mixture of things, though, kind of what the show needed and the, what the lyrics suggested. And then thinking of the overall musical palette of that season, what we didn't have or what we could use, and something like that. And I think in every show we tried to do one song that, for want of a better way of putting it, I'll say it was kind of a typical kid's song, you know, more, which is to say a bit more folk-based. When you have a kid's show, there's always those things that kind of get burned into your mind, and there's a number of things that viewers have asked about in terms of where did they come from, whose idea was it. So I'm just going to mm. rattle off a, a couple here. First of all, the juice train. Mm. Is it, was that your idea, to have the train and the, put objects you on? You know, I, I think that was my idea, and I think it's because I always thought it would be such a cool idea to have a train that could go in your house and outside your house and have somehow a, a way that it could do it through the wall. You know, it didn't matter. I mean, there's no practicality to it, really. And I love that idea, and I had probably been... You know, I'm trying to remember. I've probably been in some restaurant or something somewhere. I, I don't even know where they probably had one going around. You know, Disney going World around. Has one. Well, yeah. Well, it wasn't. I know. I don't think it was Disney World, but I'm thinking of a place in in. Um, it's a restaurant called the Bubble Room, I think. But anyways, in Florida somewhere. But they had this train that went around and sort of through all the rooms of the restaurant. And everything. Well, that's. Good. 
that's just so neat. You know, it's kind of a kitschy restaurant with all sorts of memorabilia and stuff. And I enjoyed that. So um, when we were thinking about it, there was uh, I was directed to a, a brochure someone had about, I think it's a German company, where the trains do go out. So that's exactly what they do. They go to show them going through snow and everything. And I thought, well, that's we got to get that. So that was, you know, the idea. Plus, it's, it, we thought it would be a really interesting little hook on the show, you know, just can bring juice outside and all that sort of stuff, which it did. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that, that's certainly my recollection of how we, you know, came up with it. Just, just one of those neat little things that also seemed like that group of people who were uh, all working in theater, you know, kind of the theater world, television world type thing. Um, that's the sort of thing they might dream up to have. And then you have, um, you know, a wizard and his family. You got Emelina, Winston, and Abra. Were, were those yeah. your ideas as well? I don't know who came up with those. I don't know whether that's, that'll be it's me, Clive, or Laurie, or all three of us. I can't remember. And again, it's, it's just one of those, you know, I don't even know why we did it. I, I thought about that sort of subsequently, why we thought we had to put them in there. Uh, we thought it made sense that this group of people would have some toys that they had made and have them on a shelf, you know, because that's, again, the kind of world you're in and props makers and all the rest often do and I guess speaking for myself I had all sorts of things that I had from when I was a kid and you know still had with me and you know bobbleheads and all that sort of thing so I think it probably started as that but then it seemed like it was more fun if kids could see because you know when you're a kid your toys all have a life right I mean they're all kind of uh, sensate creatures to you, you know, but then your parents come in and of course they're all just toys are just, you know, that old thing, just toys. So it would be fun if there was something where, you know, our audience could actually see the world of these characters in the toy shelf, but our characters never did, you know, that, so that's that little thing, it's that little only kids would know. And I can't remember, I, uh, occasionally I think we'd cross the worlds over, but not very often. It's, it's pretty difficult to do actually. And of course, the million-dollar question: Where are the puppets and the juice train now? The juice train—it's um, a good question. I don't have any idea. It was probably—it's one of two things. Either I don't know if we ever bought the juice train or if we rented it. Though, to be honest, uh, because you know you only needed it for six weeks a year, eight weeks a year, whatever it was. So I don't. I don't know if we ever, I think I wanted to buy it, but I don't know that we actually did. And if we didn't, it was just sent back to wherever we rented it from. And if we did buy it, it went back to the warehouse of TVO where it may still be today. <laughs> the, the Emelina and Abra and Winston, um, they were created by a great old uh, animation guy named Jim Mackay, who has since passed away. It's not related to me. But same last name, mm -hmm. and um, Jim shot them frame by frame. Uh, he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, uh, I, but you know what? I've got a. I don't know where they are. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I may even have them, but I don't know that I do. Uh, if I had them, I, I would think I would have put them somewhere, and I don't. No, so Jim may have uh, kept them. Was there any merchandise done for the show that you're aware of? No. Nothing beyond uh, uh, we had some magnets, you know, when we when TVO was doing personal Telethon. appearance stuff, yeah. stuff like that. And our cast, we did one. Um, uh, we 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 carry stuff with us when we were shooting, like the location stuff. We obviously had obviously had little magnets and things to mm -hmm. give away. And then we did, we performed once live, the cast did, and so uh, other than that, I don't, I don't believe we had much else. We, I don't think we ever had, uh, they may have done t-shirts once, TVO might have, but I don't remember that. Hmm. I think what, so. what words would you use to describe the atmosphere of working with Rudy Reb and uh, Mishu Villani and Marty Breyer and Pamela Sinu? Am I saying their names all correctly? Yeah. Sinha. Yeah, Marty Breyer. Sorry. Sinha. Pamela Sinha, Michelle Villani, and Rudy. Yeah, I would say, what would I say? Like, dream come true? How's that? Or too much fun? Or, uh, you know, any of those. Uh, for me, it just was great. I mean, I just, 
great, great cast. And, uh, you know, considering the pressure, everybody was really under. Mm. Uh, extraordinary. We had a, a, an atmosphere on the set that, that, that extended, I will say, you know, it extended from, like, at every level we went, we had this atmosphere, and it was fantastic. It's just the, the, the I think I said to you, you know, on the Polka Dot Door thing as well, uh, it's not, it's, it's about everybody. So TVO had a crew that was the best, and they were kind of all the shows in various configurations, but they were just the best people to have on, on kid shows. Mm -hmm. They were sympathetic to what we were doing. They got it. They were hardworking, really talented, and that helped, you know, because it was it, it was pressure. I mean, you're in the studio and it's 120 degrees in the studio, and it's one more time with the thing where you double step the broom dance. You know, you're going, oh my god, you just, you know, really, you think someone just say, I'm going to my trailer if they had a trailer, but um, they didn't because we had fun. People kept it, you know, the atmosphere was great and. Uh, it allows you when you're doing the show to everyone to be focused kind of on the same beam, which was which was uh, really crucial to doing a really good kids show. I think. Was there a blooper reel for join in? Probably. You know, I don't remember it. There were certainly bloopers, <laughs> and if I ever find it, I'll let you know. But um, uh, I don't think you know. I don't think it survived uh, the various moves, and you know, after the show ended. Um, and we went um, straight into polka dot shorts. I went into like from from door joined in into shorts, and sort of this office moves and things moving. And uh, and to be honest with you, there's I'm sure there is a reel, but I don't know where it is right now. One person wants to know who wrote the original stories and did the illustrations for the show. The stories were all written by the scriptwriters. Um, the illustrations were done by another group of people we had who were used uh, on a lot of TVO shows. Um, they were tremendous illustrators. Tina Seaman uh, was the first one that comes to mind. Michelle Niedenhoff. Some of them went on, you know, they were doing books as well or doing other things as well. But we had a... Doing, doing drawings for television shows is a little bit different from doing it for books in that you've got to be... Uh, aware of how it's going to be shot and the colors have to be a certain way so um, we had a, a graphics coordinator named uh, Joyce Cosby who was mm -hmm. tremendous at directing the artists into how to create the boards that we would use for the art but that the group of artists I certainly used all of them on Polka Dot Door when we did you know stories there and uh, I'm sure Clive and everybody else used them too the children that were used in some of the sections that were seen in like the classroom, did you guys just go to random schools in Toronto and get that footage or was there any kind of auditioning or was it just, hey, TVO wants to come in and get some footage? No, we went to different schools around town, like, you know, uh, different, lo different parts of the city, different neighborhoods and um, we would scout the We'd scout the classes first to see the makeup and, you know, if <laughs> the school was interested in all that sort of thing. And then we would just come into the school and uh, block, we would kind of block shoot that. We would have, um, you know, by that point we would know a number of the sequences where we wanted to have uh, kid responses or kid participation, and so we'd shoot a bunch of them in each school and then edit it together later. Now, would the director go in and give direction, or the floor director go in and do that, or would you actually go and say, hey kids, we need you to all give a hip hip hooray? Yeah, it's a bit like that. You don't really direct them so much. It's you know because it's really just more like everybody cheer, Ray! or you yeah. might ask a question. So you know, what's the what's your favorite thing to eat? You know, and pass that. Okay, great. So you just it was stuff like that. You know, and uh, you sort of figure out what to do with it later. I'm sure there had to be lots of editing that would need to be done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Give us the journey, Jed, um, from scheduling of the script, having it written, to rehearsing, to taping it, to it going on air. What's give us like the timeline? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, uh, it's they're a long way apart. You know, it's not like being a farmer where you spend three days building a fence and then there's the fence. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, overall, you'd start writing. Probably um, eight, nine, ten months ahead of where you're going to be shooting. Could be maybe a bit less, but you know something like that. And you'd uh, 
sort of assign the scripts and get them all in place. Um, and once you had done that on that on the show, you've already got to start because because Join In had significant wardrobe requirements. You had to start relatively early. You know, if you're going to do a, uh, a show about um, you know Aladdin or something, well, there's going to be a significant wardrobe component, mm -hmm. and there's going to be some set design stuff that's so you know unlike say polka dot where you're just there and we you know we we put on a, a paper box and that becomes a hat sort of thing this was far more elaborate and so the lead time is that much greater to give every department a chance to hear what you're planning to do tell you why you know if it, if they had it they'd say oh we can't possibly do that mm. you know, on, there's no way and so you say great so you're adjusting 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 mm. so um and the same thing for set deck and and you know that by that point you're probably six months away uh, from from actually shooting. Then we um, you're already talking with you know director and everybody else about the sequences we're seeing and how we're going to do them. Because again, you've got to hear if you know you know you've only got three shooting days. Is this feasible? You know, if it's going to take half a day to get one sequence, and there's this you can't do it. Mm. Uh, the music starts around then, so the cast would come in. They would. Um, you know, be doing songs, we'd get the keys, we'd get the harmonies, we'd figure out the arrangements of the songs, Bruce would, so we can get all that together. And meanwhile, we would start blocking the shows out uh, with the director just in a rehearsal hall somewhere. So that also helps, of course, because you cut script, you know, you can see how the scripts are playing, and if they're playing long, you can already be making your edits months ahead of when you're going to be shooting, as opposed to all of it on the fly. Uh, and that's the only way to do a show like like those kinds of shows where we just didn't have the budget or the time to, you know, we had to really kind of do it more or less as we rehearsed it. Um, so all of that is now you're still months out, you know, and then uh, finally you've got, you know, all the music is locked, uh, the wardrobe has been designed, and the wardrobe you're always sort of moving ahead because you're some of it's being done while you're shooting, actually. Like it's all, you're planning, you're kind of, so many weeks ahead of where you are really so we might be looking at designs for show eight while we're actually shooting show one right but they've already you're already that far ahead so um once we got into the studio the studio was like i said you know two days rehearsing three days shooting we'd already done the location stuff by then mm -hmm. so we knew what had happened if, if we need to make any change based on the location though it's supposed to be uh you know, a bright, bright, sunny day, and it just rained the entire time we were there. Well, there's going to have to be, a ch you know, we can make a change in the body of the script to reflect that. And then um, shooting, uh, you know, we shot 13 shows, so what is that, four or five was probably five weeks. But the stories, though, the, the difference is that some of the story stuff you would also shoot separately. These are just too big a... You know, too big a changeover. So you would shoot the 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 basic set stuff. You know, the the, the their studio. Mm -hmm. Shoot all of that, and then you could break that set down. And then you could do if you had some really special effects and special things mm -hmm. to do for you know special setups for the stories. Then we would do that. And of course, there was also in this show not only were you designing wardrobe for the main characters, which is relatively. Uh, basic, and they wore, you know, sort of mixing, mixing and matching, just a number of things. But then you've got all the other wardrobe you're doing for the Venetian story, you know, which is taking place in Renaissance Venice. So we've got that. We have to build a gondola. How does the gondola work? And you're also shooting, in those cases, you're often shooting what in those days was called chroma key. So, you know, it's like what they call green screen type thing where you've got a drawing and then you and you've got and then you've got set pieces that have to match what's in the drawing and you uh, so all of that would be done afterwards so uh, all in all you know it's relatively intense time and you but that would take I've forgotten how many overall weeks we had to do that um, lots of setting up obviously and breaking down set deck and painting lighting and all the all the usual and then, you know, the post-production, the mixing and the editing would take another few months, and then it would air a few months later. So, really, you know, it could be, um, I don't know, it could probably be anything from 10 to 14 months from start to mm. seeing on the air, because we also tended to play, they also tended to start sometime in the fall of the new 
whatever year it was coming out. Mm-hmm. So you might do the, the those the new ones and then drop them. You know, as you start to build up a library, you can drop into the, a, a greater rotation of them. So something could potentially be filmed and, and in post production in May or June, but it may not air until September, October. Oh, to all the time. Yeah, I mean, we were shooting. As I say, I think we shot almost every year. I may be wrong, but I think almost every year we were in Lindsay in the fall. Hmm. So generally speaking, that was our shooting window for a join in. Probably started the actual shooting started in you know late September and probably went through to November or something like that. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'd be shooting that stuff and you wouldn't see it all for a year. Hmm. Really, you know, you'd finish it. You'd finish it maybe in a fiscal year, but it wouldn't air till the following fall. So, very interesting. Now, I know that I asked you this off camera over email, but I, I know it's going to be the golden question, and I'll get myself in trouble with fans if I don't ask it. But do you have any memorabilia saved from the show? You know, I I don't, which is amazing because I usually have at least one thing from the show, and you have Storytime Mouse. I do have Storytime Mouse now. <laughs> yeah, no, I have Storytime Mouse. And I have some stuff from Polka Dot Shirts, which is funny and, and works, but I don't think on Join In. You know, the one thing I think I do have, I don't have it with me here, but as you're saying it, I think, you know, I do have these somewhere. Or do I? Jim Mackay, there was, I think there was an episode where uh, the, to- the, you know, the toys mm-hmm. shrunk. Mm-hmm. I think they were tiny. And I think he gave me those. I think I had those at some point. And I'm sad to say I don't I don't know where they are. Or or if I'm just dreaming that. He did he did I'll tell you one thing I do have. Okay, I do have one thing for sure. There was an episode where Emmalina Winston Abber had their portraits done for something. And he gave me their portraits. They're about this big, you know. Quite small. <laughs> He did give me those. I do have those, and I, um, I have to frame them or something sometime. But otherwise, no, I, I don't think I do. And I'm not quite sure what it would be, you know, apart from, uh, apart from the actual the toys themselves. Uh, I, you know, I'm gonna have to rummage around. You got me thinking about it. It might be in a. It might have been in something I didn't know they were in when offices were being shifted. And uh, well, if you come across a, a treasure chest of of. TVO artifacts. I know that we could always do another uh, little, 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 little session. You, you can parade them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, those, a, I love Maxine and uh, Emily. Uh, Maxine Miller and Rob Cowan and Billy Van played the, those characters, did the voicing, and they were great as well. I just made a great time recording them when they were doing them. They were they were wonderful. <laughs> I have a I have a viewer at, that wants to know: Are there any memorable stories that happen behind the scenes? Uh, I'm sure there are, but the, the real question is any that you're going to repeat. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that was my brain was kind of going through that. You know, uh, you know, it'd be better to ask the cast. I, I, I am copping out on that one. I don't, I don't remember. Um, well, you know, I, I'm sure there were. I think if we, if you talk to other people, they might have them, but. Uh, Apart from doing things like having Christmas in July, which we did once for fun just for us, and I'll have a turkey dinner, I can't think. I can't, think I can't remember. I can't really think of much else. Um, Were you there for most? Sounds like we had a lot of fun on the show, but I, uh, you know, I can't. I can't recall any like disastrous things or, you know, hysterically funny things that happened to us. So. Seems nothing, to be relaxing. Nothing like a lot. Uh, GP getting attacked or anything like that from Polka Dot Door. No, we didn't. We didn't come close to that level. No. My goodness. Yeah. Were you there for most tapings, Jed? I was there for all of them. Yeah. Wow, wow. How did the show end, and why did it end? And was there a cast party, and any memories from that? Um, there certainly was a cast party. The show ended. Um, after six years, and it was right in a time when TVO was uh, undergoing a significant change, and it was part of something uh, we alluded to earlier, which is where doing the original productions was starting to cut down and assigning the money to you know, uh, uh, you know funding many many other productions and being a partner in other productions was happening, 
So uh, it wound down uh, in order, I think, to allow you know what ended up being polka dot shorts to happen. Mm. And it was also part of um, you know that that management shift. There was a, there was a uh, like a big management shift at TVO. And so when that happens, so you get someone new at the top, and then you know uh, Ruth was being replaced, and so it's all about you know the predecessors. Things tend to be over. Plus, there's a whole new philosophy of television production and how to best use the, the dollars you're getting, and um, dollars are probably getting a bit squeezed. TVO was also um, putting a lot of emphasis on news at that point. They you know. Uh, when Peter Herendorf came in, I think they thought, well, we've been doing very well with the children's area, but we've really got to get our adult audience up there. You know, we can't just ignore them. So they would put a lot of effort and money into that. And uh, at the end of the day, that spelled the end of Polka Dot Door and um, Join In. And I don't know, I think maybe Book Mice ended too. A, a, a bunch of shows went down all around 94, 95, and then um, probably 94. And uh, polka dot shorts was uh, that was a you know the the Adrian Mills who was the new head of kids wanted to do something using the toys from polka dot doors so that was what we did. If it could have gone on longer, would have you been in for that? Oh, I could have done that till today. I mean, sure, if, assuming everybody could have handled it. But Longest yeah, no, running it was, children's show ever. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was really fun, you know. Um, uh, I, I, lo I loved it. And, and uh, you know, at the end, we knew, when we were doing the final year, we knew that was the final year. It wasn't one of those things where you're told, after the fact, we've been told before it started, this would be the final year. And so I had some things I, I honestly I wanted to do. I wanted to hear Rudy Webb and Jackie Richardson sing Mockingbird, so I put that in a show. Uh, you know, I had just some things I wanted to hear, so I put them. I, I made sure we got them in, you know, here and there. Um, so in that way, we had lots of you know foreknowledge, and um, uh, the show was you know the show definitely was doing very well. I mean, when it when it ended, it. Uh, was in its time slot in Toronto. I think it was one of the top five or six shows. It was. I remember. I think I may have mentioned to you at one point, but there was one point when I think you know Polka Dot Door and Join In and probably Book Mice uh, and maybe Polka Dot Shirts, but they were all in the top ten all shows in Toronto. Wow. Uh, you know, so and you got uh, your hand was, in every one of those. What a what a great accomplishment! That's awesome. Yeah, it was for TVO. It was amazing. You know, they did. They really were doing a great job at that at that hour. Well, I know you so. mentioned it earlier, and I remember reading articles that they dominated, especially in the '80s. They just dominated that time slot. You know, yeah, they yeah, blew everyone else out of the water. They did, and I don't know. I, from where I sit, you know, also I think I mentioned this maybe to you before, but also recalibrated how to do children's television. Mm-hmm. Is to find a way to do content, but do it as a, a story or a drama, as opposed to it's either content or just a silly, mm -hmm. fun little thing. Mm -hmm. and they found a way to mix the two, and that was what really started in the late seventies, and uh, I would say carried through all the way. You know, till every you can see kind of every show coming up as another iteration of different ways of doing that and how to do it and what to do, and uh, ending up with polka dot shorts, and that. Now that's just widespread throughout television. That you know, it used to be that you didn't. You know, the idea that you'd be doing some con hard content in a show was just ridiculous. I mean, mm. GI Joe was considered to be a show about working together and having you know being. And you can make that argument, but really, from an educational point, you're saying actually, you know, I'm not sure GI Joe qualifies as appropriate mm. for preschoolers or they're blowing a party wherever it was. They were some, uh, or whatever. You know, I just use it as an example. So yeah, I think there was a huge influence. I think it was, it, I'm not saying TVO was the only one, but I think they really led the way in the educational area of showing how you could do it. Mm. And, and now it's, it's everywhere. And if there's a, you know, and I think I've said that a lot of the people who worked at TVO in that time frame are the ones who are now you know, doing a lot of work all throughout children's television. So. Now tell me this, Jed, just because, you know, you were, you were the producer of Polka Dot Door at the same time, and you created Join In, and, you know, you created Polka Dot Shorts, and you had written um, for today's special. 
there had been surely by the 80s a subculture of popular television shows that TVO now had in their gauntlet was there did it ever cross your mind as a creator and as a writer to uh, like have a character from another show cameo in another one You know, I did never cross my mind. Um, like poker is showing up on the set of Join In, or you know, I would have done that. Now, that I wouldn't have done because I thought the shows were. I think I probably thought the shows were too different. I don't know whether it's one of those funny things. You know, I mean, I don't know if the thought would have occurred to me or not. It's it's one of those funny things where I think from. The kid point of view, if you, are you going to say that this is all coexisting somewhere? That's what you're saying. So, you know, uh, Jody can walk into our set. I would, it probably wouldn't have been a bad idea, but we didn't do it. Well, I just I think, uh, I think, you know, when I, when I go through the memory that I have of the shows that I watched, I, I can remember being, um, you know, just enthralled one year when, you know, she was in an episode of He-Man. And, you know, Filmation did both of those shows, right? And they were based on Mattel characters. Yeah. But they, um, you know, same production quality. They were branded very similar. And you knew that they were related. <laughs> but, you know, there was this one-hour special where both worlds kind of, and clearly different type of scenario with cartoons and whatnot. But I'm sure yeah. if I thought I could think of other live-action examples. And they, they do it frequently. Um, you know, they've done it on Sesame Street with having Muppet characters from the Muppet show show up on Sesame Street and vice versa. <laughs> So um, I remember that Jim Henson did a, the Muppet Family Christmas one year, and that was the hybrid right. of the right the Sesame Street Muppets with the regular Muppet Show Muppets, and right. I just it, it just crossed my mind, so I thought I'd ask. That was I was too bad I didn't think of it while we were doing it. It probably would have been a darn good idea. <laughs> final Where question. Were final question, Jed. While we uh, while we wrap up here, what was your biggest accomplishment from the show, and what would you say that you are most proud of? I think that goes back to what I said earlier. I think that um, at the time I was really, really happy um, with what we did with the music. It wasn't. It was not really being done at that time. It's done everywhere now. It's not even that remarkable anymore. But at the time, I thought we were doing something that isn't being done, or if it's being done, a, a not a really, it's not widespread at all. I thought we really broke in the same way that we. Uh, did the multi-ethnic thing with the cast. I thought we were doing that, let's say, music with the multi-music styles. So I was very happy with that. I was very happy with the response that we got from kids and I, you know, what we felt and what we learned, we did a really good job with reflecting a world which I think subsequently has shown to be the world we were correct. It was the world kids were going to grow up into. So trying to do our little tiny bit in how to approach that world and deal with that world, I think we succeeded really, really well. I think the, uh, you know, and, and anybody who worked on the show should take some pride in that, I would say. Mm. I think it's wonderful you're so willing to share the credit, and I just uh, think that points to your character as a person, and I know that there's a lot of join-in fans watching right now that are just thankful that you've given an hour to let us in on a little bit of behind the scenes. So thanks again, Jed. I know we'll talk for a couple of minutes after this, but thank you so much for creating the show and for sharing your talents and for taking this hour to uh, give us a little behind the scenes tour of what it was like. Well, thanks for asking the question. And thanks for everyone for watching. That's, that makes me thrilled. That's the other thing I'll say quickly. Something else that thrills me is when I meet somebody who comes up to me and tells me about the show. Mm. And they watched it when they were a kid. You know, so I always enjoy that. Good stuff, man. Well, I, like I said, I'm sure we'll chat in a couple of seconds here, but uh, yeah. in terms of the interview portion, thank you so much for giving us this hour, and thank you so much for creating the show. Okay, my pleasure.